And good morning, everyone. Praise the Lord. Just when I've stopped saying Paul for everything and got, got myself to start talking about John, we're finishing one John. So that's, but we're not done yet because there are uh, just a few more weeks, but we will also eventually be going through uh, the apostles' next two letters, uh, pretty much at a, on a trot. So we're not fully done, but this is definitely the last study we're looking at. First John. Uh, okay, before let's first go through First John, uh, the our portion for today, and then we can talk a little more. So it's First John chapter five, verses thirteen uh, to twenty-one. A good nine verses. So I'm, I'm, uh, I'm going to read uh, if you'd like to f- uh, follow in your Bible or you can have the ESV is up on the screen as well. Verse 13 onwards, 1 John chapter 5. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask, and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. So, uh, uh, as I said, this is the concluding portion. In the broader strokes, uh, how we can look at this portion is, uh, the first verse that I read, verse 13, is essentially the conclusion of the letter. Right, Verse 13 is, uh, for all practical purposes, where John has ended the letter. Now, though he continues almost in a flow, uh, the universally understood way of looking at this portion is, it's essentially a postscript. What the apostle is doing is, we know that he's written this whole letter because of his concerns, trying to encourage, trying to control uh, the believers. And now what he's doing is he's, all these instructions that he's given so far, all these truths that he's talked about, he's taking all of them, summarizing them, uh, and almost uh, trying to pull out what the possible implications of those truths are. That's what verses 14 to 21 are. Uh, I can be dry, uh, look, some of these words can be dry, but let me encourage you, If you pay attention, if you need encouragement in life, you'll find that here. Because this, uh, as you saw the title, this is, if you are a Christian, if you're a child of God, if you're feeling a little low, this is what you need. Because this is a set of uh, assurances, this is a set of affirmations about your faith and about the truth of what you believe in, what the implications are. And I think that is really very encouraging. Now, my Bible, the ESV, uh, actually on the top of this portion actually says that that you may know. That's the heading of this entire last portion from 13 onwards. Uh, I don't know what other versions might say, but that's what my ESV says there. Now, what does it mean? What it means is, uh, in these few verses, you'll notice that we know is the term or the couple of words that are constantly used to drive some truths. 
Uh, at the end of the day, it's something for you to ask yourself, do you really know that? But the, John has spoken about all these and therefore he's saying after all this teaching, we know, we know, we know. So what do we know? There are seven we knows uh, in this uh, one portion. Uh, I've just highlighted them for you. Uh, I'm a, the uh, print might be too small, but I just wanted to get the whole portion up on the screen. The first we know is verse 13, which I said is the last verse. And the first we know he talks about is that we know that we have eternal life. It's almost boring now. We don't even know what it really means. We've been saying that from when we were little toddlers in Sunday school, depending on where you grew up, or whenever. So by now, it doesn't even mean anything. But have you stopped and said what truly eternal life is? Do you read in the news about all the things they're doing just to extend the life, uh, to live a little longer, uh, about this uh, rich, uh, I don't know, the guy in the US, I think, who's living like a lab rat just because he said he wants to cross and live forever or whatever attempt. Uh, but he himself knows that he's not going to live forever and he knows he's going to die. Uh, the other, last week we heard about an 80 year old whose body has been frozen. Uh, and he, he's paid 150,000 so that his body can be kept in storage for 200 years. And maybe they can help revive. If you are a child of God, you have eternal life. Yes, constantly we're told true eternal life to understand is the life we have in Christ. And then it gets into some abstract concepts and we lose. But no matter what its concept is, the truth is you will not die. You will live forever. And you have that. And John is saying, we know. Or you should know. So that's the first verse 13. Then we have a couple of we knows in verse 15. The first we know is, we know that God hears those who pray according to his will. Do we know? The second we know in verse 15 is, uh, we know that we have things that we ask for from God. Okay, that's verse 15. Then we jump to verse 18. Uh, verse 18, 19, 20 are three very clear affirmations. Uh, but again, introduced with the word we know. Verse 18 says, we know that the one bo born of God does not keep on sinning. Verse 19 tells us that we know that we are of God and the world is under the devil's power. Verse 20 tells us that we know the Son of God has come and has given us understanding. Right? And verse 20 has another we know. The last one is, we know the true God. What amazing simple truths, but how profound they are. Right? So, so these are all the we knows. There are seven we knows that we see in, in the, uh, from verse 13 to verse 21. Uh, but I, I want to look at it differently because some of them are multiples, but essentially looking at the structure of what we're going to go through, this is how, when I was trying to say, how do I look at it? How do I give a structure to what we're looking at it? And this is how I looked at it. Because as I said, John is drawing conclusions and affirmations from what he has already taught so far in the letter. Now, interlacing these we knows, there are a couple of exhortations as well. An exhortation is an encouragement to do something, right? So there are two exhortations. First exhortation is to continue to pray for believers or your brothers and sisters who are sinning. And the second exhortation is to keep away from idols. So in a snapshot, this is what we're going to go through a lot. Uh, we're looking at a lot of we knows, uh, we're looking at, but we're looking at assurances and affirmations and we're looking at a couple of exhortations. So that is our structure of this portion. And let's get started with the first one, which I think is a very powerful uh, assurance. It's an assurance of eternal life. So what... What is John chapter 5 verse 13? It says, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. 
John is explicitly stating uh, his purpose for writing this letter. And about time, it's the last verse essentially of what he's written. Right? So he's saying, why has he written this letter? What is the purpose uh, for this letter? And lo look at it, it says, I write these things. What is these things? It is the entire body of the letter. Chapter 1, verse 1, up to chapter 5, verse 12, are these things. That entire section is what John has written, uh, encouraging readers, encouraging the believers, which we believe primarily the churches, uh, the local churches around Ephesus and that area that he was, uh, he was the responsible for. And it's an interesting parallel if you draw what John is doing. This is his letter, correct? This is First John. John has written something else previously. He's written the Gospel of John, right? Now, there's an interesting uh, verse in Gospel of John towards the end again. And in that, we see him saying, uh, chapter 20, verse 31, John, uh, he says, but these are written, again, same thing, he's written the whole Gospel and he's telling, what is he saying? He's saying this Gospel was written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So the Gospel of John was written primarily to those who were not yet Christians to lead them to becoming Christians, right? The Gospel message. So that's why John wrote the Gospel. So you may become a Christian. Now John now writes his epistle. But the epistle is now to those who have become Christians and uh, the purpose, as he notes, is to lead them to the full assurance regarding their salvation. Do you see the flow? The first one was evangelistic, the second one was an exhortation so they can continue in their faith. That's what, uh, I think it was MacArthur who says, John wrote, wrote his gospel so that people might believe and be saved. He wrote his epistle so that those who believe would know that they are saved. So that's, uh, th that is what this uh, exercise is, that is what John, First John is. Now, looking back at this verse, I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Now, what does he mean by the name of the Son of God? Does it mean any different? No. Uh, whether you say believe in the name or you simply say believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, it's effectively the same. It's, it's just the way it's written. So why is John going to these lengths? A brother said, we've spent about six months, but we haven't forgotten, right? Uh, the basics and the background to the story. The readers or the audience of these epistles have been disturbed by uh, the denials and the claims made by false teachers, correct? These people are, who were originally members of the church, then they left the church. And they didn't leave and quietly go sit they started speaking and preaching and interacting with these individual members. And, by, and during the interactions, uh, these people denied the very important basic truths that the members of the church affirmed and believed in, right, and embraced. Uh, and those people claimed, the false teachers, that they had as if some special revelation through the Spirit which these other people did not. And they would say, the Spirit tells me this. And you're like, but the Spirit never told me anything explicitly. Uh, and, and you're saying, so am I really a child of God? Because I never heard an audible voice. But they keep telling about these amazing experiences that they're having. And so the reader's assurance has been shaken by uh, these claims and these denials of the truths. They're talking, saying that Jesus never came, uh, talking about... Uh, body is unclean, so Jesus couldn't be a body. Then talking about the fact about all the other forms and other false uh, heresies that were going around. So John's primary reason for writing this letter was to strengthen the assurance by counteracting all the lies that the false teachers were spreading, right? So John is reminding his readers that they have truly received eternal life. He's reminding them that they truly know God, 
not the false teachers. It, was, it is these people who manifested uh, the authentic marks that we have looked at throughout this episode, right? That they have eternal life. They have continued in the teaching of the apostles, the witnesses, the original ones. They have affirmed the deity and the humanity of the Lord Jesus Christ. They have uh, continued uh, uh, to obey the word of God and his commandments. Uh, they have c continued to love the children of God, right? So these are the marks of a genuine child of God. And John is saying, you have shown all this. That's what he's saying. Uh, that you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that is what all these uh, further descriptions allude to. When you believe in the name of the Son of God, this is what you are affirming to, this is who you are, then these are the essential marks of someone who has eternal life. And that is the truth. So we know that you have eternal life. It is not hard to figure out. If you're not unsure, if you're unsure, you can still go through. Review takes 20 minutes to go through 1 John, and you can clearly say whether you have eternal life or you don't. Let's move to, so essentially the letter is done. Now we're moving to the postscript, verse, from verse 14 onwards. And here we start coming to, uh, so we've had the assurance of eternal life, now we move to the next assurance, which is the assurance of answered prayers. If the so first two verses talk about answered prayers, then there's a small exhortation about praying for brothers who are sinning. So let's look at these two verses. Uh, and this is, the con this is the confidence that we have toward him, that if we ask anything according to his will, uh, we, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Uh, we have spent so many years, so many times, uh, literally every Friday we encourage one another to pray and we spend time praying. Uh, but prayer can, is still something that we sometimes can't get fully a grip on and there are lots of controversy, a lot of uh, clashes in uh, trying to understand and interpret what, uh, how prayer works. But just looking at here, what we have here, verse 14 starts off with and. Why does it start off with and? Why doesn't it start off? Because it's a continuation. It's a continuation from the previous verse where we are told you have eternal life. So John is saying that along with the assurance of eternal life, you also experience an assurance of confidence in prayer. So he's just connecting them both. So it's one of the automatic things. So essentially, as a child of God, when you not only do you enjoy or know that you have eternal life, but it's saying that, of course, the full experience of eternal life is going to come in the future, right? When you get to heaven or, or when you die. But in the meantime, you still uh, have access to all of, he all of heaven's resources as a child of God through prayer. When you have eternal life, you have everything in your hand. But till we get to that point, you have access to all divine provisions, you have access to God, you have access to his presence, you have access to all the things that come with him through prayer. And that's what the and is about. And then it says, this is the confidence that we have toward him. The word translated as toward him, uh, in Greek, I think the a better way to translate would have been in his presence. So what John is saying is, uh, the confidence believers have in the presence of God. If you're not a child of God, you don't have access there, correct? So that's why this whole portion is only talking to ch believers, to children of God. And as I've said, this entire portion is again effectively summarizing and restating and adding some finer shades to what he's already taught. So this portion, these verses, you'll remember we have studied a few weeks before something very similar. And that is in chapter 3, verses 21 to 23. Do you remember that? Uh, up on your screen, Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. You have confidence. Secondly, and whatever we ask, we receive from Him, 
because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. Again, talking about prayer and telling, uh, promising uh, that God will hear. And this is his commandment that we believe in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. So that was chapter 3. And now we are in chapter 5, the summary. In chapter 3, if you notice, John linked our confidence in prayer to pleasing God by doing what he commanded, right? Believing in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and loving our brothers. Here, he is connecting it to praying according to his will. And he says, if you pray that way in line with the will of God, he says, uh, according to his will, he hears us. Again, hears is not the best uh, Hears is correct, but to me, this is because of how I understand the language, I don't know about you. Hears just is, if I shout, someone will hear me. It's, it's a lot more than that. Uh, I believe, uh, looking at how it's used uh, uh, in the dictionary, it says, giving heed to. You know, giving heed to is a lot more than that. Uh, if my child asks for a lollipop or a chocolate, if I give heed to, it means I give him that, right? That's what it is. So uh, here, giving heed to is that responding positively to. If you pray in his will, he will respond positively to you. That is, uh, that is what he's saying. This is the confidence we have towards him if we ask. So this is the kind of assurance you should have. And it says that... Uh, then we come to verse 15, which is essentially driving home the same thing by uh, in a rephrasing it by saying, if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. Notice the change of tenses, the request we, we know, we have the request asked of him. Do you, is that the attitude you have? Half the, time, half the time we keep asking and then saying, I wonder if that got through. Uh, or you could be distracted. Was I focused enough in my prayer? Do I need... He's... Essentially, you pray, you know you're done. God has heard you. That is the right attitude. If we know, uh, as it says, verse 15, if we know that he hears us, you know that he hears us because we have the confidence to enter his presence. Because you have eternal life, you are his child. God cares for and is, uh, he gives heed to you. God, God is attentive to what your needs are. It's something that, uh, again, we might keep by saying it repetitively, we almost are blase about it, but it's a profound thing that the sovereign God is mindful of what your needs are and what you pray. Uh, yes, he's sovereign. Yes, he chooses to work through the uh, uh, puny, weak human's prayers, but that's how he chooses to operate. Now, the condition for all these amazing powers of all the resources of heaven is according to his will. Now, before we go and thinking, oh, this is amazing, uh, let's understand what some of the implications are. So, again, this can be abused and misunderstood if someone just takes uh, and which very often happens, we pick one verse from the Bible and says, yes, this says, Jesus says, all your prayers are answered. It never works like that. So uh, time will not permit us, but at least uh, it would be inappropriate if we just move on. But So I just want to throw at least a few quick verses that I picked up about what are some of the, when we say uh, that God will answer all your prayers if you pray in his will, when you're talking about that, what, do, what are some of the other things that are un, almost implied? The first thing that is implied is that you are a believer, that you're a child of God, that you abide in Christ. Remember right from the beginning, John has encouraged us to abide in him because if you abide in him, he abides in you. How is this abiding happening? Only when you are saved. So the first thing is all these uh, amazing resources are unlocked only if you are a child of God. God in no way is obliged to listen to the prayers of an unbeliever. So John 15, 7, If you abide in me, my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, it will be done for you. 
So that's one condition. Uh, an another condition is, I think, a very big, very important one. Uh, what is the motive? Are you praying that you want a brand new sports car? And you're wondering why that's not happening? Simply, what is your motive? And that's what James has wrote, written, James 4.3. You ask and do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. Have you ever stopped, have you ever considered about your personal prayers, unanswered prayers, saying, did it come from the right place? You could, you could say it has something to do with ministry. But even about ministry, where is the motive? Is it that people may hear or is it that people may recognize you as doing something profound for God. So, motive, very important. Uh, James 4.3, next one. Uh, something that we all uh, know is faith. And whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. This is something that has been told time and again, so I'm not, uh, James uh, 1, 6 and 7, again, very familiar. Uh, let him ask in faith with no doubting, for one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. And uh, let me add uh, one more, I guess another very important one is uh, something that Jesus himself tells us, uh, John 14, 13, we all know that, have been taught many times, whatever you ask in my name, you ha your prayer has to be in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And we have spent a lot of time looking at what is the name mean. The name means literally you're asking in the stead of Christ. You're saying that for in the name of all that Jesus is. It's as if Jesus is asking. So question is, would Jesus ask for the same thing that you are asking for? Could you say that? Uh, one more last one, obedience. And 1 John 3, 22, we just looked at it a couple of minutes ago, right? That we uh, and whatever we ask we receive because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him and this is just a sampling there are many more there's uh, about confession it's about there's so many aspects but all i'm trying to say is praying in the will of god is not a casual exercise it it is about your life it's about your testimony it's about it's about the whole person that you are and that is when your life can be in the will of God and your prayers can be in the will of God. But then you have all of heaven's resources available to us. So that was verses uh, 14 and 15. But let's look at, uh, so while talking about the power saying that uh, you have the assurance of having your prayers answered, uh, John goes into another section. I don't know about you, but this has been... Uh, there have been a lot of discussions, a lot of controversies, a lot of books, lots of studies on the next couple of verses. Where John says that, verses 15, uh, 16 and 17, If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to de death, he shall ask, and God will give him life. To those who commit sins that do not lead to death. Right? There is a sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is a sin that does not lead to death. Uh, right? Very interesting. First, what is John simply telling? John primarily firstly is telling that he's telling his readers or exhorting them that if they see a fellow brother or sister sinning, uh, they should pray for them. Uh, and they can see they're sinning, not because they're supermen or have x-ray vision. That means the person's behavior is showing sin. Uh, so this is not talking about uh, sin in the heart or any of those. He's talking about visible sins, right? So if, if you see someone's lifestyle, if you see the actions of a fellow believer and they're sinning, we are encouraged to pray for them, right? And you might say, ooh, that's interesting because it says, uh, he shall ask, that means the person, the believer who sees the other brother sinning, uh, and God will give him life. So does it mean that if a believer is sinning, they lose life and then God will, and if then I pray for the believer, God will give life. Uh, a simpler way to understand this is something which has been time and again, what happens to us when we sin? Do we lose eternal life? No, thank you, we don't. Because uh, 
but deliberate intentional sin will destroy your assurance of salvation it will destroy your joy of salvation and and you you'll almost have every reason to doubt your salvation but it does not mean that you lose your salvation and so you, by you praying for that brother god is saying that he will forgive and uh, in many ways he says he'll give him life so that 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 was the easy part but this only applies to those who commit sins that do not lead to death so the big question is what are sins that lead to the death and more importantly have you committed them be, uh, the first question the second question i can answer no because if you did you wouldn't be alive now right so that's easy that's easily answered you haven't committed that but what is now for uh, john john didn't specify what they are perhaps he taught them the churches at some point but he didn't teach us explicitly so uh, uh, there's it's been uh, explained in numerous ways uh, and uh, various popular ideas have been offered such as false teaching blasphemy against the holy spirit apostasy uh, uh, but very quickly uh, after going down and spending a long time reading essentially but uh, most conservative things pretty much now agree on one broad possibility but there is also i i'd say the two one is talking about believers one is talking about unbelievers okay and it somehow after reading some of the very strongly worded things i think it's perhaps talking about unbelievers because john is writing this entire letter to attack false uh, teachers right so it would seem logical to say that in some way he's uh, the focus is still the same people that's why i say it's very likely that the sins that lead to death are talking about false teachers because sin that leads to death is that which excludes life correct it's death a sin that prevents you from having the son because if you have the son the son is not the son the son of god you have life so the brother who or sister who's sinning uh, and whose heart has not already been transformed who's not born again right now why i think it applies to false prophets very simply is because they have denied who jesus is if you've denied the deity of christ and the humanity of christ if you've denied the lord jesus christ you cannot have salvation he the only way to be saved is there is by one name alone right uh, we have no confusion there are no you can't buy uh, alternate paths there's no shortcut there's nothing there's only one way to the father through the son if you deny the son you're doomed and that's what the false teachers have done and they have therefore committed a sin that leads to death they have no hope and paul is saying uh, john is saying don't even uh, he's saying uh, i do not uh, there is i do not say that one should pray for that he's not forbidding but he's saying i, I there's no there's no point praying for them because they are already doomed uh, right so that is, there is the other possibility which i think uh, very few i've seen mekata or says also says that is a possibility but again we can't be too dogmatic uh, it can apply the primary reason he raises is he gives two possible uh, examples uh, in the church in the book of acts ananias and sapphira believers struck dead by god right the believers struck dead by god and then first corinthians chapter 11 verse 30 that is why many of you are weak and ill and some have died they are believers members of the church taking part in the lord's table as we will in a few minutes but because they sinned because of the testimony because of further details which we don't know god chose to strike them dead so uh, so there is a possibility that uh that can also be referring to sins that lead to death right so in verse 17 then says okay so those are the two things uh, believe when a believer sins you pray god will have mercy will forgive and those are the sins that don't lead to death but the lifestyle and the sins of uh, false teachers are people who are not born again uh, those people are doomed 
uh, verse 17 says, all, just Paul, uh, John reminding us that though uh, God does not punish every sin with death, every sin is nonetheless a serious matter. That's what he's saying. All wrongdoing is sin. So that, and that is a violation of God's command and should be confessed and should be turned away from. Right? Now, so that was about answered prayer. Now we move to affirmations. We've had two assurances about answered prayer. You've had assurance of eternal life. Uh, I'm way out of time. Okay. Uh, very quickly, talk about three affirmations. The first affirmation is uh, protection by the Lord Jesus Christ. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God protects him and the evil one does not touch him. Uh, if you look at your Bibles, and if it's not ESV, the words are slightly different. But uh, for once, though it's not literally accurate, uh, because I, when I looked at the Greek, uh, uh, keep on doesn't exist, but ESV wrote that, but it helps, because the meaning is correct. Uh, right? John has told you that if, if you're a Christian, and you say you do not sin, you're lying. So Christians lie. Otherwise, Jesus has no reason to be standing and interceding. He can just not do anything, correct? What is Jesus interceding for? You and me. Why? Not because we've done great exploits for God, but because of our failings, because of our shortcomings. And he needs to intercede. And that's his constant role there. Because we're messing up all the time. That's our life. Uh, our path is righteousness, but nonetheless we fail. But the fact is that... Because you're born by God, because he transformed you, you will not keep on sinning. And that is, why do you not keep on sinning? Because he who was born of God protects him. Uh, because of the, there was a transformation in our life. Uh, I will not, uh, but the transformation is from slaves of sin, we have become slaves of righteousness. The seed of righteousness was planted. A new person was born again. We have two characters. We, all the truths that have been, we are all very familiar with. So I'm not going to read all this in the interest of time. And, uh, but the simple fact is, uh, if you look at the second time, so we know everyone who has been born of God is talking about you and me. Second, but he who was born of God, not talking about us, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, but he who was born of God protects him. The Lord Jesus Christ protects us. You enjoy the protection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, you remember God, the Lord's prayer in the garden, uh, uh, John 17, the high priestly prayer, where he says, Father, keep them. Uh, protection is keep them. Uh, he says, he prays to the Father saying, I have kept them. But then he says, I'm coming to you, so please keep them. I'm not asking you to take them away from the world, but keep them, protect them. That's what Jesus' prayer for us was explicitly to God the Father. And then John 10, 28, 29, what a powerful, strong, I give them eternal life and they will never perish, no one will snatch them out of my hand. This is what he's saying about us. We are kept by the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so that's... Uh, the that's the first affirmation, affirmation of your protection. What do you enjoy? As a child of God, you enjoy the protection of the Lord Jesus Christ. He will keep you. Second affirmation, affirmation of our identity. Who are you? Who are you? We know that we are from God. You know, Jesus said, you're of your father, the devil. It does not apply to you and me. Amazing, right? Our father, our paternity has changed. Our father, and the ho but the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Sorry, uh, just missed a point here. It says, just wanted to very quickly say, uh, it says that Jesus protects you and the evil one does not touch you. Uh, I just want to say that touch you is not touch. Uh, trust me, more than touches happens to all of us, right? So what does he mean? Touch again, you go hold, uh, look at the detailed meaning. It means lay hold of. So it's not touch, it's lay hold of, it's grasp. So because while 
you get tempted you will fail you will uh, they will the devil will influence you the devil might lead you or you might lead yourself to even sin occasionally but the devil can never take a hold of you take charge of you right or remove you from the light and that is what uh, the truth is and why can it not do that because the lord jesus is protecting you and now you are belong to god we know that we are from god and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one but the rest of the world does not enjoy that so the first affirmation is affirmation of protection the second affirmation is who you are you are from god you are a child of god uh, let's almost a summary last one this is a great a uh, summary statement about the true knowledge of god and its source in some sense we've heard today it's about knowledge it's about understanding and this tells you where you got that from there are two things it tells us about what the lord jesus christ has done what are the two things he has come number one number two he has given us understanding right and the present tense of come means he's come and is with us his presence is with us and the understanding that he has given us is he's given us the knowledge of god the father himself remember when jesus also said that you cannot know the father unless through the son and whom the son chooses to reveal right we remember that and so you if you want to know god and you say i'll bypass jesus there is no access that is the only way and the lord jesus came for that express purpose and he has done that so but notice it's interesting in this verse uh, this is a very powerful verse because one is it's talking about god the father primarily notice that there are three true there are three truths here so that we may know him who is true secondly we are in him who is true uh, thirdly he is the true god now if you read it quickly just to confuse you the first true is god the father the second true is god the father the third true is the lord jesus christ but if you read it slowly you will understand the flow the lord jesus christ has come and has given us understanding so we can know intimately know and have access to the true god who is the god the father and we are in god the father through his son the lord jesus christ because it's only through the lord jesus christ that you can access access god the father and then the last statement is blows it all away if anyone says oh jesus is just a prophet he is the true god and eternal life see really the bible never says that jesus is a uh, god that it only says he's a prophet but here you have and what a strong powerful statement he is the true god and eternal life and he is the life we have that is what the lord jesus christ is to us last one one short verse of exhortation against idolatry little children keep yourself from idols uh, very appropriate where we come from we know idols because a lot of western commentators are very confused they're saying i uh, don't know why john suddenly went back to idols yes there are idols in ephesus and so on but we know and uh, we know the warning it's talking about the exclusivity of christ and our god and our life our attitude our behavior has to show that allowing anything else to take position or uh, primacy over that is idolatry and that's what we have warned against so brothers and sisters this is what the conclusion of john's epistle it's uh, as i said it's a it's a huge list of uh, amazing assurances and provisions that we have as children of god and uh, it is uh, an assurance of eternal life uh, of answered assurance of answered prayers of our protection of our identity of who our savior is and the simple question again as i said is for us to consider is as john says these are all things we know my question to you is do you really know and are these your personal beliefs may god bless his word